Yeah. Norman Perrin, my teacher at Chicago, we used to call him Mr. Mark because about all he taught was Mark. He was a Boltmanian. And he used to say uh, about 70, the year 70, what they, I can't do his British voice, what they most expected did not happen. And what they least expected came about. Most expected, the visible parousia, final judgment into the age. Within 40 years, that generation, what did they least expect? Rome to triumph and really have its best years in the second century. Uh, Rome didn't go away. So you've got to do something. And that would be the when, right? But what if if we're trying to be sort of like theological or biblical historical positions, you know, analyzing why does this happen? I think it happens because a misunderstanding of what the texts are actually doing. And I want to uh, suggest to you two rubrics that you can work with. One is what I like to call, uh, and I made this up, so maybe somebody else has probably said it better, but a floating prophecy. So if I go to the United Nations tonight and we're standing on, I think it's Second Avenue maybe, with the flags, and I turn around and look at the Isaiah wall, carved, look it up. You can Google it later and see. The Isaiah wall, it's beautiful. In front of the United Nations, they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, and nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now, how is that introduced? It's sometimes translated, it will come to pass in the last days, Okay, well, then you go, oh, we got some calculations here. I wonder when the last days are. I'll put that there. In a... But actually, if you look at it, it's it's actually the idea of uh, in the la later even, sometimes it's translated, you know, after that, this will happen. And there are a number of those. Uh, Isaiah has a lot of them. Isaiah 11 is another one. There's a stump of Jesse, the royal line of, of David that leads to David. It's cut off. And someday a branch will sprout, okay? Say, well, that was Jesus. I mean, he's he's the branch. That's where the branch Davidians get their name. Well, so would every other Messiah of history, and there are quite a few, even in Josephus, you know, who says, oh, I'm the branch, you know, I, I'm the one. So I call it floating because it actually could happen 100 years from now, a thousand years, if, if you're somebody that thinks the Messiah hasn't come, but that prophecy will still come, it's just out there, right? It's not tied to something. And those kinds of prophecies often can then serve us, I think, well, I mean, here it is on the wall of the UN. So what does it become? It becomes something I think most of us would agree is rather beautiful. Or Isaiah 11, the wolf will dwell with the lamb. And the little child will put its hand on the den of the adder and so forth and so forth. You know, that, and, and the world will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What a great aspirational idea, you know, if you understand knowledge of the Lord to be basically justice and righteousness and peace and goodness and love. We all want that. But I can't do a calculation with that. You see, it's just out there. And when you have a candidate, there's categories and candidates. Let's say we're doing the Messiah. I got a guy, David Koresh, right? His name was Vernon Howell. Vernon Howell, he's a candidate. I'm sorry, he's plugging himself into the category. You see the idea? Well, then a floating prophecy can come alive. So right. he said, no, I'm, there are two Messiahs. He'd always say things like, God, Moses struck the rock twice. And the rock was Christ. So there's the first Christ and the second Christ. And then he went through and found all of these texts. And most of the texts he found are the floating texts. Like you'd have no reason to think, you know, if you're just reading your Bible, oh, I bet this will happen tomorrow. You know, the nations are going to all start. And if you remember Isaiah 2, it's preceded by what? They will all come up to Jerusalem and they will ask to learn the Torah. And then peace will come. Well, that adds a lot of uh, specifics to that one little bit. And so I would so start with that, that, that 
lots of prophecies are just out there in and of themselves. They express beautiful concepts that many of us would want to affirm. But what gives them life is when someone says, actually, now this is happening and here's the countdown or here's the specific fulfillments. And in that case, David said, I'm the sinful Messiah, you see, and therefore uh, that can come about. So I think why it fails usually is because people go to these calculations and try to come up with something that they're pretty convinced is in the text. And the main two books that are used, I mean, you're not going to use Psalm 22 to set a date. They pierce my hands and feet. That's going to be any persecuted Messiah. You know, Chorus was shot in the side. I remember people would say, oh, he's wounded in the side. Jesus was wounded in the side, you know, so forth. Uh, so, but if you have the book of Daniel, the visions of the book of Daniel, Daniel 2, four kingdoms, well, we can count them, right? One, two, three, four. And you get to the fourth kingdom, which in New Testament times, they're probably thinking it seems like it's Rome. Earlier, they thought it was uh, the Ale Alexander the Great's empire. Then You've got four kingdoms, four beasts, horns you can count, and then calculations of days and chronology. And that's the material that that kind of fuels uh, these very specific applications that come up with calculations. And there are many of them, and some of them are kind of interesting. You've got these floating prophecies, and then you've got the really specific ones. And when you can come up with dates and calculations, it really does fuel the flame. But the other thing that has happened in our own time, and this might be new, like you've lived to see this, all of you, and that is, I gave a lecture in Jerusalem once, it was called When Jerusalem Means Jerusalem. So all through history, you could read these prophecies, like, oh, the beast, and the two witnesses are going to lie in the city for three days, and it's the city where our Lord was crucified and so forth. And you would try to figure that out, and some people would try to make it future and so forth. But I mean, Jerusalem was, during most of this period when this was being done, it's part of the Ottoman Empire. You know, it's really not. Nations certainly aren't going to go up. It's not even uh, Jewish. So what Hal Lindsey built on was the possibility that a set of events happened in the mid-20th century that refueled everything in a new way, not just coming up with new dates and calculations, but actually being able to go on the ground now and say, well, let's see what's supposed to happen. Jerusalem will be trodden by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. That's a Luke 21 reference, but it's based upon the book of Daniel chapter 8, that the sanctuary will be defiled by Gentiles and then be vindicated, literally, it says. Well, that, that's that got to be 67, right? And I think camping used that. And so add that. So why does it fail? The reason it fails is the prophecies that you're going to go to for those specifics, we have the best scholarship on, probably, of any other text. In other words, Daniel 11 is probably the main text. And from verse 40 on, it tells you, and at the time of the end, this and this and this will happen. And it's after Antiochus Epiphanes. And what does it say? Basically, a final evil ruler will come. And to use Second uh, Thessalonians, a evil guy, a man of sin, will sit in the temple of God and claim he, claim he is God. Well, you need a temple. You kind of need Jews maybe to build a temple because it says the temple of God. And so we live in a particular time when people can begin to talk about those things and even maybe want to help the fulfillment a little bit, like Maybe we could help. I'm a Christian, let's say, and I don't believe, I believe Jesus is the one and I'm going to get raptured. But in the meantime, I could help the, you know, pay, pave the way for the Antichrist because it's got to be a temple. We don't have to get into that. So why does it fail? 
because take Bart's book, Armageddon, going through the book of Revelation. We can go through those texts and pretty well talk about the Roman period during the reign of Nero, during the reign of Domitian, and we can make sense of some of those things. And the same with Daniel 11, we can go to the post-Maccabean period, as the Dead Sea Scroll group did, and then begin to plot and predict tr the troop movements that are going to come next. The king of the north will come down, the king of the south. The problem with that is none of it happened. Verse 40 on never happened. Even your fundamentalist Christians would say that never happened, but it's going to happen again. But where is it going to happen? The king of the north, the king of the south, they'll enter the glorious land, the holy land, and so forth. So it sets things up. But the very prophecies that seem to be the most applicable to our day are the ones we probably understand the best. They're not floating. Like, literally, they are tied to very, very specific uh, events. There's, there's not a lot of mystery in terms of... Uh, you know, depending on how you read, you could say, well, who are the two witnesses then? Well, you know, uh, if you're putting it in that time leading up to the Jewish war and so forth, we've actually got a number of people. Now, did their dead bodies rise <laughs> into heaven in the sight of all the nations? This would be what they were expecting to happen, you see. Mm -hmm. But we can track quite a bit of it. Five have fallen, one is, one is yet to come, and when he comes, he'll... Uh, our three kings, you know, you have the, the yeah, yeah. year 68, 69, and the same with Daniel. So I think what's happening is the prophecies that specifically get into the details are best explained historically. How many times have you heard prophecies duel? Antiochus was an evil ruler, but there's going to be another evil, evil, evil ruler like him, like Hitler. You know, let me read you... Uh wonderful quote. Some of you know the name H. H. Rowley, the, Rel the Relevance of Apocalyptic. He wrote it in 1944 in the height of World War II. And oh, that was a heyday of apocalypticism in America and the United States. Mm -hmm. And here's what he, he's talking about. Uh, remember, Hitler was wanting to fly down from Berchtesgaden to Jerusalem He'd already sent Goebbels to meet with some of the Arab uh, groups there. And Rommel was supposed to defeat Montgomery and come up from the south. So you got the king of the north, the king of the south. They're going to enter the Holy Land and so forth. So here's what Rowley wrote. And I just, I love this quote. He says, yet where for more than 2,000 years, a hope has proved illusory. We should be aware of embracing it afresh. There's like, let's retract those battle movements in Daniel 11, or let's reread Revelation 17 and kind of redo the beast for maybe something in the Muslim world today or the Soviet Union or Europe. The writers of these books were mistaken in their hopes of imminent deliverance. Their interpreters who believed the consummation was imminent in their day proved mistaken. And they who bring the same principles, notice the same principles and the same hopes to these prophecies will prove equally mistaken. And he's writing that a year before Hitler died. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not over, but it's beginning to be over. And the thing that scares me, as I said about this, is I'm, you know, final evil rulers, please, could it be over now? Do we really want... You know, and then there will be great tribulation, such as was not since there was a nation till that time. No, don't rerun that. You know, and so what do we do? We take a historical reading of it, and what we can see is the authors are project. They think they're in the end, and so they're projecting ahead. Uh, I've made the argument that Revelation 18, that lament over the fall of Rome is written in the light of Pompeii. It talks about the ships at the sea weeping over the city yeah. that in one hour has been engulfed in flames and so forth. And uh, if it was written after Pompeii, obviously they would have realized, well, actually it didn't destroy Rome. 
you know, just the Pompeii and Herculaneum and so forth. But believe me, people in Rome could see it. Remember, Pliny was on, got uh, Pliny the Elder, got uh, was on the shore. Uh, so why would the author say that? Because he, he's thinking it's just a precursor to what's going to come. Like, mm -hmm. what, look what happened. So I would just, that's where Revelation really fits. Mm -hmm. And Daniel 11 fits in the first century BCE with people expecting now the deliverance to come. 